So in this video, we're going to explore the beginnings of quantum theory. So this section is going to be really, really complicated. And um, so I'm going to try and make it as simple as we can. But there's a lot of really interesting abstract ideas in here. So remember, we're studying this because we want to understand the behavior of atoms. And so know something about why they behave as they do. So we've already seen a little bit about that. So we saw Bohr's model for the atom. And we saw that that you know, works very well for predicting certain kinds of properties of the hydrogen atom. But really, it doesn't work so well for any other atom on the periodic table. But it was a great starting point. And there were important, a couple of important ideas that came out of Bohr's theory. First, that the energy of the electron is quantized so that it can only exist in certain fixed energies and can't have an energy anywhere in between. And so that was sort of the basis of quantum theory, this idea of quantized. So that means only fixed energies are allowed. Only definite fixed energies allowed. In addition to quantization, we know something about this idea of that sometimes things behave like particles and sometimes things behave like waves. So de Broglie was able to show us that we could even think of the electron as maybe having something like a wave nature. So we usually think of an electron as a particle being like a little dot or a little speck that's localized, a little lump of matter that exists at a particular place, right? So um, not spread out at all like a wave. But de Broglie said, well, maybe we could think of uh, these electrons as though they were spread out in a wave. So we also had this idea that kind of grows into quantum theory, the idea of particle wave duality. So duality is just a fancy word that means can be two things at the same time. So particles and waves, they can be both, neither you know, one or the other, that kind of thing. And then we also had this idea of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So I'm just going to abbreviate that H. UP for Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And remember, he said that um, that there's always some uncertainty in the position of the um, of a particle and its velocity. Velocity, so you can't know both position and velocity at the same time with infinite precision. So you can't know them both exactly. So you can know them both with some uncertainty. Yeah, you know, I think it's around here, and I think it's going about this fast, but you know, plus or minus something. So that's what. Heisenberg said. And he actually quantified how certain you could know those two quantities. So taking all these things together, in 1926, a physicist by the name of Erwin Schrödinger, by the way, over his name, that's supposed to be two dots. Uh, I drug my pen across the screen, so it connected those as two lines. But um, Erwin Schrödinger um, came up, he was a physicist, and he took some of these ideas and put them together into a wave equation. So he knew something about the phys physics of waves. And so he wrote down a wave equation that agrees with all these properties for matter. And so that's called the Schrodinger equation, or sometimes the wave equation. And so sometimes this quantum theory is called quantum mechanics or wave mechanics because it's based on this wave equation that Schrodinger wrote, wrote down. Now. This equation is really cast in kind of a complicated mathematical language, and we really don't need to go there. All we really care about are the results. So um, I'm going to just draw sort of a big box here. And this box is going to represent this fancy mathematical machinery that we call the Schrodinger wave equation. So I'm just going to write that down here. I'm just going to call this the wave equation that Schrodinger came up with. And so what we really care about is mostly what we get out of the wave equation. But I'll just talk real quickly about the stuff that you have to put into this equation. So equations are always written in terms of variables. And so we're going to need different variables to plug into this equation. So the first thing that we're going to need to know are the masses, masses of all the particles that are involved. We need to know the charges of all the particles that are involved. And we're going to say something about that, hey, you know, we've got a really big, massive, positively charged nucleus. And so I'm just going to put that information in there. And then we also need some rules that will tell us how these charges interact. So we need some sort of potential energy function. And so that's going to be given by something called Coulomb's law. And we talked about that 
before. So we need some sort of potential energy equation that tells us how charged particles are going to interact. So we know that plus likes minus. Well, can we describe that mathematically? OK, so you need that mathematical function. And you're going to plug all that into the wave equation. All right, so this side doesn't really matter. But you should know that we can write down different wave equations for different kinds of systems that have different masses and different charges. So what comes out of this wave equation? Well, two things. First thing are energies, quantized energies. So over here, we're going to write energy. And I'm going to write over here that these are quantized. So in principle, these energies can only take on fixed values. So we get that out of the wave equation. And then there's something else that we get out of the wave equation that's a little bit more confusing. And it's called a wave function. It's given the mathematical symbol, the Greek letter psi, which looks kind of like a trident or a pitchfork. So that's the Greek letter psi. We would write that out, P-S-I, psi. So that's the Greek letter psi. And that's just the symbol that um, Schrodinger used for his wave equation. So we're going to use this to represent these things called wave functions. So what are wave functions? Well, wave functions actually tell us something about the probability or the likelihood of finding one of our particles, like our electron, our nucleus, at some location in space. So wave functions are related to probability. And in fact, they're related this way. If you take the wave function and square it, it's going to be related to the probability. So I'm going to rewrite that. and I'm going to say it's related to the probable location of our particles. Right, so we want to know, um, for example, what are the energies of the electrons in the atom, and where can we find them? So that's what we get out of the Schrodinger equation. So we get out information about energies, right? And they're quantized. So what are their specific energies? So this gives us a way of calculating numbers, right? It's a quantitative theory. And it also tells us where we're likely to find our electrons. So remember back in Bohr's model, we had um, a picture that looked kind of like this. Remember, we had it was like planetary model or solar system model. So here we had our proton that makes up the nucleus, really massive and located right here. And then there's a really light electron, I'll write that E minus, um, in orbit around, whoa, that's a funky orbit. Anyway, you get the idea. In orbit around this nucleus, right? So where is the electron? Well, Bohr would say it's somewhere on this ring. Now, de Broglie would say we could imagine that this electron is like a wave, and it's spread out over the whole ring. But now we've got this wave function that comes out of quantum mechanics. And it's going to tell us, for example, if you were to draw a little box right around here, and we could ask the question, well, what is the probability that the electron is inside this little box that I've drawn in space somewhere? Well, the wave function here will tell you that probability. It will give you a number. It will tell you, oh, a 0.326% or a 10% chance depending on how big you've drawn your box and where it's located. So this is really useful. This is kind of like an orbit in a Bohr's model, because an orbit would tell us where the electron, where we could find it, right? It would be on this ring. Well, now we've got this wave function that tells us where it would likely be found. And so because of that analogy, sometimes a wave function is simply called an orbital. So there's supposed to be quotes there. All right, so orbital. So it's not an orbit, right? So it's orbit-like. That's why we put this al at the end. So it's an orbital, right? So it tells us where we would likely find um, our particles. So that's what quantum theory does for us. So we're going to apply quantum theory then to atoms. And we're not going to care so much about all this stuff that happens in here. But we're going to care a lot about what the energies are and maybe even what the wave functions are and where we're likely to find our particles. So first, we're going to apply quantum mechanics to the hydrogen atom. So we're going to look just at the hydrogen atom. So for the hydrogen atom, uh, the wave equation gives us, so I'm just going to write S E for Schrodinger equation. So after you solve the Schrodinger equation, so that's a big mathematical job, um, then you get out energies. And they're quantized by this little number n. And we've seen that already. In fact, it's the exact formula. It's this um, minus 2.18 times 10 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. So that's an 18 up there. 2.18. 1 8 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n squared. And n is just a number, an integer, 
one, two, three, four, and so on, up to infinity. Those are supposed to be commas there. Make them look more like commas. There we go. And then we can keep on going all of the integers up to infinity. And so our energies are quantized then. And this is exactly the same formula that Niels Bohr got, right? Well, we're not surprised because Niels Bohr got those energies right. So the Schrodinger equation is giving us that result that we knew already. Now the Schrodinger uh, equation also gives us these wave functions. Now these wave functions then depend on what the energy is. So they have this number n associated with them too. But they also have two other special numbers that are associated with them. This little script L and this other number it's called M with a little subscript L on it. So we've got N, L, and M sub L. These things taken together are like little labels that will tell you which function to use. So they're as much uh, keeping track of things. But they do also come out of the mathematics of solving this thing. So n here is the same n that we talk about up here. So for a particular energy then, you're talking about a particular label n for this wave function. And remember this wave function is going to tell you where in the heck you're likely to find that little hydrogen atom electron. So this is going to tell us where we can find that. Is it orbiting the nucleus in a circle or is it some other more complicated shape? We can figure that out. Anyway, these numbers n, l, and m sub l are called quantum numbers. And we'll learn more about quantum numbers in just a minute. So quantum numbers. The quantum numbers are n, which is called the principal quantum number. And it's called the principal quantum number because it's the one that tells us what the energy is. So once you know n, you can use that formula to calculate what the energy of the electron in that orbital is. So it's called the principal quantum number. And it can take on values. n can equal 1, 2, 3, and so on, dot, 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 up to infinity. The next one, L, sometimes called the angular momentum quantum number. It's called the angular momentum quantum number because it relates to this thing in physics that's called angular momentum that an object that would be orbiting or spinning around would have. And it's not important that we know what that is, but we need to know what it's called just for nomenclature's sake. So L is called the angular momentum quantum number. And L, it turns out, depends on what the value of n is. So L can be as small as 0, so it starts out at 0, and then it counts up in integer steps 1, 2, and so on until it becomes as large as n minus 1. So if your n is equal to 0, L can only ever be 0. If n is equal to 2, then L could be 0 and 1 as two possible values. So our principal quantum number is going to limit how big the angular momentum quantum number can be. So our final quantum number is this one called m sub l. And that's a subscript curly l that's there. And this is sometimes called the magnetic quantum number because it's related to certain magnetic properties that the um, electron can have when it's orbiting an atom. We say orbiting, but really we know the motion is going to be more complicated than that, probably. So m sub l then takes on these values. It can be as small as negative l. So that's why we have the subscript l on it, because it reminds us that m sub l depends on l. So it can be as small as negative l. And then we count our way up in integer steps all the way through 0. And then we can keep on going in integer steps until it becomes as large as plus L. So let's look at some examples just so we can get this down a little bit, applying these rules. So let's say that N, oops, not M, say that N is equal to 4. What are the possible quantum numbers that go along with N equal 4? Well, if N equal 4, then L could be equal to 0, 1, 2, or 3, right? Because 4 minus 1 is 3. So it could be as big as 3. And then for each one of those, right? So for each one of these, we could define what our L's are going to be. So like for this one right here, if L happens to equal 3, then M sub L would be 
starting at negative L, so that would be negative 3, and we count up an integer steps. So the next one would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, so now we keep going through 0, to plus 1, 2, and finally the last one would be 3. So all of these are possible values of m sub l that are consistent with this value of l and also consistent with this value of n. So there are some sets of quantum numbers that you could imagine that don't agree with those rules. So let's look at this one. So oops, if n, yeah, I did it again. If n is equal to 2, and L is equal to 2, and M sub L is equal to negative 3, we would say eh, that violates the rules. So if N is equal to 2, L cannot be 2. L could only be 0 and 1. So that violates that. And similarly, M sub L cannot be equal to negative 3 because it can only be plus or minus um, L. So it has to be bounded by L, so it can't be bigger or smaller than whatever the L value is, positive or negative the L value. So those are our quantum number rules. Each one of these sets of numbers then is going to say something about where we can find the electron because it's going to change that wave function. So remember these three quantum numbers label that wave function. I see I told you this was abstract and complicated. So we're looking with all these numbers. So we'll draw some pictures in a little bit about where the electron is going to be found according to these wave functions. So we have these three quantum numbers. They will specify for us which wave function we use, and that in turn is going to tell us where we find the electron. Oh, where, oh, where is your little electron gone? Right? So that's going to tell us where the electron is located. And so those are the basics of uh, quantum mechanics for the hydrogen atom. So in a future video, we're going to go through and look at these different wave functions and see what they look like, where we are likely to find these electrons. Are they circular orbits, or are they something different and more complicated? Do they look like shells or something altogether surprising? And um, so we'll look at those for the hydrogen atom.